Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, I wanted to chat about Bastions. Bastions have kind of been consuming my brain space since they came out. What was it like two yesterday? I think it was yesterday. <laughs> but it has been in my head because Bastions are like a kind of cool example of D&D design. Uh, that is the kind of design that just sort of fascinates me. And so I, I'm just going to dive right into it. Well, before I do, let me, let me say two things. Uh, bastions are something that I feel like, uh, like a lot of times in design, I'm just like, I, you know, I appreciate it as a DM, as a player, but this is something I've actually worked on a fair bit and thought about a lot from the design perspective. Um, and I've played with over the years, right? So like, uh, in AD and D, there used to be these, these rules that when you got to ninth level as a fighter, you became a Lord. And you got followers and you were granted, a well, you could build a castle. It was a little nebulous. And then later in the DMG sort of explained, like, you, you get to build a castle, a small keep, and you have mercenaries and you pay for them. They come to you, but you must pay them for, the, for them. And, and kind of interesting aspects of, of what does it do for you to have this in the game. And uh, that progressed over the editions. There are a number of, of really interesting box sets and source books for second edition. Uh, third edition had this little puppy here, Stronghold Builder's Guidebook, um, full of all kinds of meaty rules for you to detail, you know, every square foot of your place and what it could be like, what it cost to do it. And one of the fun things I did was uh, in third edition for Living Greyhawk in my region, um, which was part of the organized play program, I administered buildings. <laughs> I came up with rules for how players could take this book and follow its rules using their actual gold that they'd earned across all of their play. And they could take all this mo money and coin and turn it into owning a tavern or a keep or whatever it was that was, you know, interesting them that, that caught their, their idea uh, and, and stimulated them into wanting to spend all this money on, on what kind of had no real benefit, but was super cool in terms of bragging rights and being part of the community to say, I've got this keep on a hill or I own this tavern. Um, I use the rules myself as well for my character. Uh, but I, and that was part of the fun of it is I was thinking of doing that. And then I got to use these rules and get approval for them and use them in our organized play program. And it was really fascinating. And since then I've gone on to, to have other experiences, um, working with MCDM, uh, on some projects, part of Kingdoms and Warfare, which made me look at all of their interesting rules and in their strongholds and followers book, um, where you really are building a like you know a tower for a wizard, and here are all the things it does, and here's the cleric's temple, and here's what that does for you. Really interesting design, um, though I wasn't involved in it to be clear. Um, but then I also worked on the Acquisitions Incorporated book, which had these rules for franchises, and that was also really interesting. And so. All of this makes it so that I'm just super, super, super motivated by the topic of bastions. And when they mentioned them uh, ages ago at the D&D Summit, feels like ages ago, uh, earlier this year, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, uh, I was like just like dying to see this, right? What is it like? Um, it's all I could do to not like go to somebody in the front of the room and say like, could you just let me see it? <laughs> Talk to me about it. Tell me more. Uh, but now we all get to see it. And so I want to look at uh, these rules. I want to chat about kind of how I look at them and and and, and what I appreciate them about, about them and what I wish they did differently. Because there are a number of things where it's not quite the kind of experience that I'm looking for. Um, so looking at the rules, I have to start with, before I even read this, I always, when it's a big system like this and I'm really interested in it, I always want to look at it and think, okay, what is it that I want these rules to do for me, right? What is it that, that I think a bastion system could do that would be like super, super cool? And I jotted down some ideas before I even looked at it. I said, you know, going back to that third edition experience I had in the organized play program, a reason that players come to a dungeon master and say like, I want to build a tavern or I want to build a castle is because it's a super cool way to be creative right? You want to design something. You want to feel like you own it and have the bragging rights of the fact that this is yours and that you designed it and even that you paid for it, right? So like in the AD&D days, I have an old notebook where in it is scrawled all these bad maps of my castle. <laughs> 
And I spent a lot of gold, I mean, a lot. And it drove me to adventure to get more gold to build this thing and to populate it with monsters and work with my DMs to get them to allow me to have all these various things in it. I even wanted, like I wanted a Bucknerd's Everfull purse that I could put in the treasure chamber. And every day a hireling is like emptying the coin. So I'm constantly gaining money. And this was just so fun to me, even though I never, ever used that in a game. <laughs> never came up. No DM ever wanted to use it. I can't blame them. Uh, it just existed there, you know? So, so it can be just this fun, creative exercise that you even will spend gold on because you just want it to exist. But ideally, it goes beyond that, right? You want a home to like provide benefits. Like, I want that I own this tavern, and therefore, I hear stories that patrons are sharing, right? I can get information. Um, I build a... Um, warehouse i own a series of warehouses and i make money off of the trade right and maybe i'm tied into the city because of this maybe i get to be part of the political underpinning of the city because of these things so ideally we want to get some benefits i think that generally players are looking for story benefits but that varies by player the dm also likes these kinds of things hopefully because they help you create stories so when i was playtesting the franchise system, um, I started with just the idea of in my Tomb of Anni Annihilation campaign, uh, you know, 5e hardback book, um, saying, hey, you guys in Portney and Zara, you, you're talking about how you want to try to identify with your religion and maybe bring people in and teach them about the religion that you believe in, because it was sort of a mystery, who's my God, but he thought he'd maybe figured it out. So, you know, you could bring in acolytes and start training and then sort of have a church. And to other players, you know, like they had gotten a pirate ship and, and one of them was very much a pirate character and thought, I want to have a pirate ship going around and doing things. I don't necessarily want to be on it because I've got to go adventure, but like I'd like it to go and do these things and engage in piracy. And that helps the DM create stories because I could then weave that into the world, let them know what had happened and create a system by which we were kind of engaging in that. So they could be in the Tomb of Annihilation, deep in this dungeon and maybe a little bit tired of being in a very big long dungeon and i could say hey cutscene, let's go to what's happening with your pirate ship right and we could maybe even run that with like a b team adventure or we could just simply say like hey you receive a sending uh and it is from the person who administers all of your your holdings from your town where you're set up and here's what they tell you happened to the pirate ship and maybe we even use it as downtime and we say, hey, make some rolls, right? So that's a good example of how the DM can create stories and can be very involved in a system like this. Um, having staff and hirelings is cool and it can help you have personalities, um, stories around them that's neat, right? So like ideally, you, you think of it almost like a movie or a novel, right? Oh, we've got our weapon master. What's the story of that weapon master? What's that feel like? Um, Facilitate the players coming in with wild schemes and wild ideas like the whole pirate ship thing, right? That's a neat idea. Or maybe, hey, we want to uh, involve the, the royalty in the area in uh, our business. Or we want to push for this kind of thing to happen or change in the land, right? We uh, Taking the Tomb of Annihilation example, um, the players in my campaign did things like bolster the princes and fight off the uh, the people who are coming in from other lands, the Amnites and the uh, Theans and the um, Baldur's Gate Flaming Fist, you know, through the organization that they had. And um, another thing that can come up is too much gold. What do I do with all this gold that my player characters have? Or players might say, I have all this gold. Wouldn't it be cool if I could do something with it, right? Could I own a business? Could I do something like that and derive some benefit from it? Um, and the benefit doesn't have to be more money. It can just be, you know, influence, power, things like that. The kind of things that you'd think would create a great story, right? Um, sometimes it's personalization around a character. So the wizard wants to say, uh, like, I remember I had a character that I wanted them to just like research everything they could about summoning demons. We played Lost Caverns of Sojkanth. It has all these like tomes in it. And, and so that led to this whole, like, I want to do all these things. Or I'm a paladin. I want to further my faith and you know start up a school or something like that so it can really weave into your character story 
Um, and there could be group goals, right? Like the idea of that we're influencing trade in the region or we run, you know, a network, uh, a spy network, right? Something like that. That could be really fun. That could tie into the patron system that fifth edition has. Uh, so what kind of things am I a bit afraid of? Because there are a number of things that when I'm doing this, I'm, I'm, when I'm looking at this kind of system, I'm a little worried about. How long are you away from the table or from the type of adventuring that's typical of D&D? Some of it's great, right? A break from like the Tomb of Annihilation can be really nice. Spices it up and then you go back to the Tomb and you're refreshed. But too long and it can feel like you're playing another game. Uh, and if it specifically feels like a mini game, that can be okay. But if it's not as fun as D&D or doesn't feel like it's part of D&D, that can be a problem. Like we once played using a different rule system, but we used the Pathfinder Adventure Path um, where you run a kingdom and you sort of explore sandboxy around the realm uh, or around this area of land. And then you build up a place and you sort of roll to see what happens. But the rolls felt different from what we were doing. We would do a certain thing in the story and then we'd make a role that had a totally different story. None of it was associated, right? And we would progress in ways that didn't jive with the story of it. So that sort of dissonance where the time you spend away from your, on this system, away from the rest of your game, doesn't link up with it can be a problem. Power creep, right? If, if the things that, if the benefits of this system make you just stronger, well, I may already be having trouble challenging my characters, so what is this going to do for me? Um, and then uh, optimization, which doesn't necessarily need to be power creep itself, often is, but where when I look at the choices available for me, they are complicated and different enough and maybe not balanced enough that I choose on the basis of what will be optimal, right? The more complicated the rules are, the more arbitrary, the more that they have mechanical bits, the more that one can optimize them. And we'll see some obvious choices of this or examples of this in, in this when we look at it. Um, the other thing is trap choices is part of this. The other side of this is where we're just some choices, just a bad choice. Like, no, nobody should run this kind of a building. It's bad. Then why do we have that? Right. Uh, or if it's like um, you as a cleric should obviously choose this thing. But as a player, as a character, as a person who wants to do well in the world and in the campaign, you shouldn't. OK, so so those are the things that I look at. And now, you know, let's really take a look at this document and see what's it all about. Um, there are a couple of sections to this Bastion rules. First of all, it's 21 pages long. <laughs> and that is maybe one of my biggest thoughts on it is 21 pages without art is enormous, right? Uh, one of my friends said, what else in the DMG takes up 21 pages? Like maybe magic items, you know, like 21 pages is a huge section of a book that already exists in its 2014 form and will be, we'll have more art and we'll have a larger font. And so where do you stick this thing? Like this is too big. <laughs> um, but okay, so we're gonna have, we're gonna have the basic rules of this document. We're gonna see what you can do with these points that you can generate and how you generate them. We're going to look at the type of special facilities that you get at each level. And then there are some things around what if this falls apart or if there are events related to the Bastion, then how does this play out? Um, all right, so let's look at the document here. Um, we get a definition of what this is home stronghold place of power it's pretty loose which is good i like that it you know it doesn't just have to be a castle or something like that um it's not automatically one thing or another though it still lends itself to being a castle type place and i wish it was a little more flexible than it is um this really happens through the types of um of like the idea of putting a wall around it, which is sort of obvious the idea of how it gets attacked, um, which we'll see. Um, another thing that's interesting about these rules we're going to see is they don't really use the core rules of the game, assuming those are going forward. So, for example, when it talks about hirelings, it just says, hey, you have folks working for you. It doesn't say use the existing hireling system in the Dungeon Master's Guide and Player's Handbook. Uh, it also doesn't use downtime or I think at all refer to downtime, which is shocking to me because I thought for sure 
this is one of these things that downtime already occupies this space. So, so just to just completely disassociate from downtime, I thought was really, really an interesting choice. Um, it says it gives them new ways to spend their gold, uh, but we want the gold to make them feel happy versus making mortgage payment. That's great. But I don't know that that's what this is doing. And to me, it's more of this is it's ways to make gold and not a lot of it. Um, or it's big spends because that seemed like a way to control what's going on. All right. So how do you get one? You become fifth level <laughs> and the DM decides to use this. Uh, that right there is an interesting choice. Well, fifth level. D&D has a problem in that it has 20 levels of play. Some additions more or less, uh, but currently 20. And most players don't get anywhere close to 20. They may not get to 10. And so anything that you design in the game, you want to think through, will players get to use this? And starting at level five, maybe halfway through their career and their story. If you think about the published adventures, level five is easily halfway through most published adventures. Uh, and that's kind of strange to then suddenly have this experience come in and then try to weave it into a campaign or story. It's fine as an option, but I would personally like to see that start earlier, right? I may want to use this in my story earlier, the way that patron system can work at any point in a career. In fact, often works well at the beginning as a setup for what kind of adventuring you do. You get complete control over the shape, style, and function of your bastion. So you can say, I'm a wizard, I build a tower, I'm a cleric, it's a shrine, and whatever it might be. And then I just have these structures that are part of it. Um, you, we then go straight into, well, we get a little bit of rules here. Each bastion begins with two special facilities. You're going to get extra ones at different levels. Uh, and you contain, you have basic rooms, um, which somewhere here it tells me how many of them. It's a couple of them. I think it's two as well, maybe. Um, so you... Then we have the concept of bastion turns. And the uh, this is a really tricky part of the design. I'm sure they wrestled with this a lot because campaigns are so different, right? You have some printed modules or hardback adventure books for D&D that really happen in, in not that much time um, or that have the pressure of time, like the, the death curse in Chult in Tomb of Annihilation. You know, you don't have months to do this work. You, you might, but, and, and maybe you should, as I've argued in one of my products. Uh, but, um, you know, as written, you are racing against the clock. And so there isn't a lot of time for bastion turns. And that's a little tough. What this tries to do is assume that you're going to take a turn every week and that you are going to have uh, six to eight turns per level. So your first level that's going to last six to eight weeks is what they're saying and you'll get those many turns and maybe you have fewer or more but that can that the system doesn't really adjust for that doesn't scale for that they just say hey this may happen and i think that is a big deal and we get some examples i really like this of of how it might play out with the d with a the dm talking to the players about it hey you you know have some time be, you know now you took care of the cult um you can come back to your bastion and take bastion turns and this matters because the idea is that you're going to get these bastion points and how many you earn, especially at past level nine, at nine, nine and higher, will be based on whether you are able to be there present at your bastion and tell it to do specific things with your special facilities or whether you're going to take the default action, which is to just maintain the thing. It sort of it runs on its own. And. It, it's an interesting concept to go with this sort of generation of points. It's not bad, but it, it instantly becomes a sort of accounting. It puts you in the realm of accounting and of players sort of doing math, right? And, and cost benefit analysis. The moment you assign points like that, that's what's going to happen with it. People are going to look at when is the sweet spot to spend it. And this is especially a problem, I think, in the system because the spending is so big versus the generation, which requires you to think across many levels. And I don't know that that's what's great for a story, but we'll see. Um, so how do you get points? You each week that you can take a turn, 
right, which may have totally vary in the campaign, you are going to be either present at your bastion and able to issue specific special facility orders, or you're away. And if you're away, then it runs in maintenance mode. Maintenance mode will always generate 1d4 bastion points per uh, special facility you have. And the number you have is based on the level of the facility or the level of your overall bastion, uh, which is your level. Um, you can use money when you give a bastion order to spend 25 gold, never scales, there's just 25 gold. So you should kind of always do this unless you somehow can't afford it. And you will get to roll the dice twice and take the best. So, you know, roll two, keep one, the highest die uh, to get slightly more generation out of it. What can you do with these? And then we're going to look more at that math. You can spend the, the sort of first thing that if, if not the default thing is you will use this to buy magic items. And I think that's really, really strange. Um, I think magic items are something, and even the way the fifth edition Dungeon Master's Guide talks about it, magic items are something that is really about the DM, right? Like the DM is like, uh, my campaign, here's what the, the magic item should look like, how many I should give out. It might be a lot, it might be Monty Hall style campaign. Everybody gets, you know, all kinds of things, or it may be very, very few. Uh, or we may be running a hardback book, and those can actually be all over the place in how they give out magic. Sometimes giving out fascinatingly powerful uh, to, to one character and almost nothing to another, right? And the wizard may find no scrolls and just things like that. And so now here's a system by which you can spend a bunch of points that you've saved up to get um, the, the this item. And there's a level prerequisites for the very high level ones, as you see here. The cost is not small, right? 700 for legendary item. Any character, any player that is typical, you know, typical players are going to look at this chart and they go, legendary, oh, how can I get that? Well, i got to be level 17, level 13. And again, most play doesn't take you for most groups to level 13 or 17. So this almost is just a carrot that won't play out. Uh, rare at level nine, and then you can just co get common and uncommon ones fairly cheap. So let's look at what it looks, uh, what the kind of point generation uh, ends up being like. And I'm going to share this Excel file here. And you can see this, um, that what this chart shows here, I just ran, ran the math as I could using some assumptions. And here are my assumptions. When we're issuing special orders, we are going to spend the 25 gold, roll twice, keep one. It's a low amount of money. Why not? Um, if we're maintaining, then we're just rolling our D4. So, so that's just kind of the math of how it works. Uh, we're going to assume we're always spending the gold. We're going to assume normal rounding of dice of, and, and, you know, what the numbers should be. So round up. It doesn't always round down the way you do for a lot of uh, like monster hit points and things like that in D&D. &D. Um, we're going to assume that there are seven turns. It says six to eight. We're going to assume seven turns. And we're going to assume that four of them out of the seven are maintained. Three of them are you're actually there. I think that's actually really generous. I wouldn't be surprised if in many campaigns, six are maintained and one is actually there. And I wouldn't be shocked if in most campaigns, you can't get seven turns out of the play because you are just in a dungeon for a, you know, a lot of play time, many, many sessions of play that aren't even a week, right? Or are barely a week or two of play. So you, I just... It'll be interesting to see, but let's assume seven turns per level, four of them are maintained, three are special orders. And we're assuming that I'm not using the rules for your place getting attacked and shut down. I'm just going to assume that it's doing fine and there's no problem uh, going on <laughs> with, you know, uh, as we'll see in the, the rules saying that, oh, if you were attacked and you didn't have enough defenders, then a facility shuts down. Um, so here's the levels of play uh, in column one. Um, then we have the number of facilities the system grants. It starts with two. It gives you two more at ninth level. It gives you one more at 13th and one more at 17th. And on each maintain turn, you're going to uh, generate, uh, you're going to roll a D4 for each facility. So 2.5 times two is five uh, of the bastion points that you're generating, right? So if we're running that four times out of the seven weeks, we are generating 20 points in levels five through eight. 
We also get to do our three orders. So each orders is then gonna be that roll and keep mechanic of the dice. Now this is easy to calculate because then the die type that you roll is based on this same level structure, nine, 13, uh, 17 is when the die increases from four to six to eight to 10. So by um, when you are level five, you are rolling D4s for your, uh, you're gonna roll two D4 and keep one for each facility. So you have um, two facilities and you're gonna roll those dice and keep one. And so it's like 3.13 is it what kind of the average of roll two keep one D4 is. So 6.26 is what you get and you're doing it three times. So this is the total of your orders. So we're doing maintain, we're doing order for a total of seven, which generates this many points per level. And if we start adding them up, you can see what it generates. And I should say this is per character, right? One of the things the rules make clear is you do not pool with other characters. You don't give your friend some or anything like that. Like you, you do your own spends. So, you know, when it comes to uh, in the rules where it says, hey, a common item costs 20 uh, uh, BP 20 of bastion points. Well, at the end of fifth level, you can probably buy a common magic item. Do you want to? Maybe not, you know, and I could see most players going like, nah, I'm going to wait. And then at the end of, uh, level six, you would have 77 and you could spend 70 and get yourself an uncommon magic item. Probably worth doing. Now you're down to zero points, right? But if you don't, you can keep them and get to 100. And let's talk about what else the rules say uh, you can do. Because not only can you get magic items, but you can spend 10 Bastion points to gain advantage on charisma checks if you're within 50 miles of the Bastion. I suspect this won't come up in many adventures. It's a little bit of a strange benefit. But the other thing is, spend 100 Bastion points and you return to life in your Bastion at the next dawn. And it doesn't seem to matter what's going on, right? Like usually at low levels, you can't just bring a character to life if they were disintegrated or fell into acid or something absolutely horrible like that. So here you are and you can just get back to life. It's a get out of jail free uh, card. Now there could be some problems like if you're in the elemental plane of earth and you die there, well now you're back at your bastion. Someone's gonna have to go get you or you've gotta somehow get back to where you were. So there are some problems here into how this can really work but it's a hundred points and we can see that you know looking at uh, this excel spreadsheet um you know a hundred points happens at the end of seventh level if we haven't done anything else with our points and that's this is where i don't like systems that have points in this way because it creates this sense of what is the payoff right i am a player maybe i want to get that 70 spend and get a magic item. But oh wait, if I just wait till the end of seventh level, I can get myself a re free resurrection. So I should probably do that. So now if you think of subtracting 100 off of this, because you're just keeping 100 in the bank, right? I've got to get all the way to, the, to mid ninth level before I can again buy an uncommon magic item, right? And if I want to, instead of an uncommon magic item, get a rare magic item, since now I'm ninth level, then I need 250, which will be a total of 350 if I want the insurance of bringing myself back to life. And now I might not do anything with my points until I reach 11th level and I'm partway through that 11th level, at which point the campaign has probably ended, <laughs> right? That's a problem of point spend systems like this, um, especially with big costs like that. And I get why they're doing it because they don't want you to just take a magic item and, and spend a lot. But I think that when you start doing this sort of mathematical accounting, it leads to players not doing a lot with the points. And it's not my favorite way of going about this. Um, you can see that eventually you start generating a fair amount, right? You've got five facilities. And one thing that's tricky, and I calculated over here, is you have a number of facilities that are getting replaced. So when you become uh, level nine, you get th you get two more facilities and one of them can be upgraded. And, and then, but eventually it's sort of like at the end, you still end up with a lower level and these all produce different rates. So it's, it's sort of a tricky calculus, which it's one thing to do a spreadsheet. It's another thing for your DM to try to do this on the fly. 
I don't super love that either, that the DM could make mistakes. In fact, I worked with our Patreon Discord, thank you, Patreon Discord, to give me the ability to do this video and to fix the errors I had in my spreadsheet because it's confusing and hard to calculate this all out. And that's what's gonna happen with DMs here if we're trying to figure this out. So, all right, that's Bastion points. That's the way you use them. Don't super love it. I like some of the concept of what they're going for. I don't think that this, the goal of a Bastion should be magic items coming back to life or advantage on charisma checks. I, I think that's not great. I think it's it's not story based. It's it doesn't meet those goals we talked about, right? Of story of what I like. None of these benefits have anything to do with the fact that I created a wizard's tower or that I run a pub or anything like that. It, it requires work to even explain, um, and doesn't really facilitate fun play. Just out of these bastion points. But okay, there's a lot more here, um, and it's not like this is terrible. I'm please don't get me the wrong way. I'm being critical of this on purpose, um, you know, analyzing and critiquing. All right. So the next thing is, and it's the meat of the document, because here we're at page three. You know, this is not so far very big, um, but we're going to get, you know, 21 pages worth of this. And then the cantrips are at the end, which is separate. Um, so we get some rules around building it, putting it together. I'm OK with that. I think that people do usually want to map what they own. It makes it feel real. It's cool. You might want to do art of it. And so there's some rules for how big the space is, uh, especially your basic facilities. Like it's a little weird that you you have to kind of choose, like, do I have a bedroom and a kitchen and that's it? That's not very exciting. Or do I have a washroom <laughs> and a kitchen, but no bedroom? Am I sleeping in the kitchen? Am I sleeping in the washroom? It's a little weird to sort of have only a few of these and then later you can build them. Uh, which you can spend gold and it takes days to kind of happen. This is a gold spend, so I do like that. It is really simple. You know, it's not at all like the Stronghold Builders guidebook level of complexity. Um, but it, it's a, I don't know. I don't know that this is important to play under this particular system to detail that I paid for the courtyard or the dining room especially when I don't know that I'm going to do much in these rooms. So being abstract or just letting me have whatever I want it to be might work just as well. It might be better, might be more fun. Um, there's the only real teeth to this thing in terms of cost is defensive walls because they have a game benefit and you can spend money to put a fence around them. I wonder if there's a larger system they envisioned around mass warfare or something like that that maybe they'll do later or something until they want this sort of you spend on the wall but i think that this is um yeah i don't know it's a level of granularity that's a, that's work when it may never come into play which is what we did in the olden days <laughs> we of course survived that all right so there's the basic facilities there's how to make them bigger so you can make them a larger size there's a way that it starts to begin with and then we get this special facilities and you can see here where you get them at these various levels of play. Some have requirements, um, they take up space, they come with hirelings automatically and you get to give them orders and there are a couple different types of order turns. And this table um, summarizes them in order. And an important concept to think of is sort of there's this block of fifth level options, block of ninth level options. When you read them alphabetically, they jump all over the place in terms of power level. When you look at them in groupings, they're a little more logical. Um, but let's take a look at some examples uh, of what these look like. Um, and I'm going to refer to kind of, I did a cheat sheet uh, in Excel of, of kind of what these do. But, and then we'll take some examples. So the arcane study. Uh, requires an arcane focus or spellcasting focus. So we're already saying like, hey man, you want to study arcane stuff, you must be a spellcaster. And, and, and in fact, an arcane spellcaster. Can't be a cleric that wants to find out about these things. Okay. Um, because it's low level, it's 1d4 uh, uh, bastion points each time that you order the crafting, uh, which is what you would do instead of the maintain order if you're there. If you're at your bastion, bastion this week, because 
that will give you to the ability to roll two dice, 2d4, and choose the highest of the two. In addition, you get to do these things it talks about here. Sometimes you have just a thing that the benefit that you a benefit that you get, and, and then the actual order you give. Uh, in this case, it's just a quiet place to research. No default benefit there. But at the end, we get a default benefit. Cast identify. When you've spent a long rest in your bastion, for the next seven days, you can cast identify once. No material components, no spell slot. Cool. I think that's neat. That's a neat kind of cool benefit. You can do it a lot with identify, so it's pretty loose as to what it does. Yeah, okay. Now our order. We order to craft. We get our bonus points or our, our bastion points, and we choose to either craft an arcane focus, which you can, uh, seven days later it shows up, and you don't pay any money. In fact, you can sell it for 10 gold. And you can instead craft a book. You spend 10 gold, and a week later you have this book, and you can then sell it for net 15 gold. And this is the kind of thing where I go, I don't know that we need all this, right? Like, if I, so if I'm making money, I should only make books. But why? It might be fun to say that I make an arcane focus. Like, like it, the creativity of it immediately is sort of funneled down into one, into an accounting measure, right? Um, so, okay, you know, books it is. You should make books or you are a fool at money if you're going to sell things. So you make books and you make 15 gold. And I don't know that 15 gold a week is a thing that player characters need to make through this. Um, okay, but I do get to cast identify. Um, and in theory, if I ever needed one of these things, well, then I could use that. Um, let's go ahead and skip to another one, the garden. I'll mention the barracks very quickly. Um, which is interesting because it generates a defender, which is part of the rules. So this is the kind of thing where you might feel that I don't want my place to come under attack. I'm playing more of a mini game. I am going to create one more facilities will be barracks so that it defends against attack. But if this doesn't end up happening, you know, I get no other benefit. So why do I do that? It's a, it's a little weird. Um, but let's go now to the garden and compare to what this is like. So the garden has four different types that you can create and gives you very good flexibility. You can sell flowers or mushrooms for a total of 50 gold, which is way more than the 15 gold that the arcane study gave us. We can, instead of the 50 gold, take a potion of healing, which is 25 gold worth of product. So I don't know that you should do that. Um, it's weird. Um, or you can get two vials of antitoxin or a vial of basic poison. Uh, again, we could buy the antitoxin. I didn't look up the price of that. Um, or one vial of basic poison. But look at this. Like all four options, not two like the Arcane study had. Way more gold. Why? You know? And so, you know, that's where like as a wizard, you might think like, ooh, wizard, I should get the Arcane study. But if I really want to make gold, I should get a garden instead, <laughs> right? Um, uh, one I like a lot, I think is really kind of neat, is the library. And the library for a level five uh, structure lets you do something really very different than this whole generate gold. It says you can re research in this facility, and when you use that research um, order, you can say, hey, here's my topic, a legend, an event, a person, a creature, famous object, and a week later, you get three accurate, up to three accurate pieces of information about the topic that you were asking about that the DM chooses to share. That's neat, right? That's creating an interplay with the DM who might use this as opportunity to spill the beans on something else that's coming or give some insight into a problem. I like this a lot. To me, this is the kind of thing that I find more interesting. Um, it, and, and this is broad enough that I, you could see using this often across time. Um, what else do we have? We have a sanctuary, which can let you cast healing world, healing word without a slot, or you can get a five gold piece staff or symbol. So I guess the idea is maybe like the idea that you could cast identify or that you could get this healing word that's balanced against gold production. 
Mm, okay. Um, you can craft a magic item, a plus one magic item with the smithy. Kind of cool. And it is a way to spend gold because with the smithy, you uh, end up having to pay some gold to have that item. Um, interestingly, you cannot sell it as written here. You spend 800 gold, fair amount of gold, uh, given this is a level five facility. And you end up with a plus one weapon. And now you have that. Um, and I guess you would then use downtime to sell it. It's unclear. Or maybe you're not supposed to be able to sell it. Or you can make a miner's pick instead of a plus one weapon. Or a shovel. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's interesting. <I'm laughs> Did you make a plus one weapon to bring to this adventure where we're going to fight a you know some creature that can only harm by magic items? No, no. I brought a shovel. You know, I don't know. Role playing can still be fun. Um, and you can also create a either simple or a martial weapon as this plus one weapon. So no exotic. Um, so, you know, I find this very interesting that the level fives aren't really balanced necessarily. Or if they are, they're balanced in ways that kind of cross the tracks of whether it's generating money or generating a, 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 a benefit. Um, you have some that just give you like information and others that are giving you a very discreet thing like a magic item and then others that are generating money. Um, and then what also is interesting is that now when you reach ninth level, you are in theory going to sell off some or whatever, convert some of these activities into a new one. And wow, that's a kind of fascinating thing to me, right? To like, um, that you're going to like, you know, you might spend in theory, you know, four levels enjoying your garden and then you're going to look at these rules and go i should really get rid of the garden because <laughs> i you know it makes a lot more sense to have this other thing right that makes more money or does whatever that i need it to do um let's give some examples of what these can be like um ninth level has the gaming hall uh the gaming hall is just pure money with a little veneer of story and i'm not against that but um, you basically open up, open up a gambling den for the week. And at the end of it, you roll. And that percentage dice will dictate whether you make anywhere from 10 average of 10 gold to average of 350 gold. Okay. Um, that's a fair amount of work, you know. Um, the... Uh, Instead, you can do some other things. So like the sacristy allows you to regain a spell slot of fifth level or lower when you spend a week there as part of your generating orders, you're going to do that. And then you can craft holy water and you can interestingly empower it to be more dice of damage to where it does an extra 5d6 damage. Um, I think it's probably d6 default. I forget in this edition, but let's say it's 66. Okay, you know, yeah, that can be worth doing. And you do pay 500 gold for that. Um, and you can also make a number of other little minor magic items. They're actually pretty cool that last, I think, for a week, it says. Uh, let's take a look at the sacristy. Um, but that's a you know interesting idea. Yeah, you can see wand of magic detection, all these things, and the properties last for seven days. Kind of cool. Um, I like that. Um there is the scriptorium, which lets you duplicate a book, create 50 copies of a pamphlet, or craft a spell scroll and pay from 50 to 100,000 gold bees. And I don't, yeah. Hmm. The other hilarious thing, if we think about these various options we've talked about, is the stable where you can spend a week to buy a mount and then the next week sell it for 15 gold profit. And you can spend $2,000 to have more horses that you sell. And I, I don't understand the math of that one. So again, this sort of balance concept is really interesting. Uh, really some fascinating ones, the teleportation circle, the theater, we throw like performances. And I like that, but I think I would prefer to abstract this because the rules here aren't sort of necessarily backing up what's going on in the larger world. And all of that just becomes the work that DM has to do. So like take the theater... It's neat that it has this idea that when you're creating a performance, you've got these various people who are involved, a performer, a conductor, a director, a composer, a writer. That's neat. But, you know, 
you you're kind of making a check to see whether you manage to pull this off to get a benefit nothing talks about the larger idea that maybe you know i have a theater that's in the middle of town in fact the whole bastion itself it's one thing if it's on a rocky outcrop out in the boonies well how are people even coming to my theater or if i'm in the middle of town how does my menagerie work relative to the fact that I'm in the middle of this town? And, and shouldn't things happen because of this? And yeah, of course the DM can do the work to say like, well, you own this theater and here's what happens one night, totally irrespective of this order. But that's all just work that we have to do and nothing's really kind of allowing for it. I suspect that if we had a, a less defined system but let gave you examples of like, hey, run a theater, run a, you know, alchemist lab, whatever, a trophy room. Then players would fill that space and would do things with it. As an example, if the benefits of facilities were just benefits to downtime that can be benefited from that facility and players got to design the facility, you might end up with a lot more interplay that the DM can feed off of, just as a thought. Um, okay, so let's just talk about the, the, the ninth level ones. We saw, you know, something like 10 to 350 gold pieces or 15 for a couple of horses, um, creating books, things like that. But some cool things like the regaining a spell slot. Level 13 is our final level. Um, and it can really vary what this does. So we'll take a look first at the archive. The archive go way back up to the top you can see how many pages this all consumes um really simple you have a really rare valuable book and you get to choose what it is and what it is gives you an advantage on this type of skill checks i guess always if it, the topic applies okay cool i think that's neat um and we give some example books and you the dm can create other books and so on uh, and then you can issue the research order. And when you do that, you can get the benefit of legend lore spell. Kind of cool. And the next time you talk to the hireling, the hireling tells you what this legend lore does. All right. That's kind of neat. Um, the observatory, another good example. In the observatory, level 13, again, you've got to be to do that. Um, you can like look at the stars and even into wild space in the astral pain, apparently. So you can contact other plane once when you spend a week here and issue this order and um and that's part of spending actually when you spend a long rest there that's not even using the order but when you use the empower you can explore the eldritch mysteries of the place and at the end of that you roll a die and if you succeed with getting an uh odd result then Something out in the multiverse grants you a charm from the Dungeon Master's Guide, which gives you a one-time capability. Um, dark Vision, Heroism, Charm of Vitality. One of these charms that's out there in the DMG. That's, that's interesting, right? Very interesting. Um, demiplane. Very cool concept. You actually make a demiplane. Uh, it's a little silly that you have to kind of... It, it's empty <laughs> and you can use the order to fabricate a five foot cube of stuff. So it's like, am I making like a dinner table? And then do I have to make chairs separately or are we assuming the chairs come with it? Um, and then that's a week and I got to wait another week to fabricate again. But anyway, we can do the fabricate uh, or actually I guess it's a magic action. Oh no, you have to do a long rest. So once per day you can fabricate things to, I guess, slowly start building up your demi plane to have, you know, rugs and whatever's. Um, but I think it's a little interesting. I just let me, let me trick out my demi plane. Really? Do we have to go week by week? I think it's okay if we just trick out our demi plane. Um, it, it can't be scried upon. So that's just sort of like the benefits of the demi plane. So you can just hide away in there. Cool. Um, and it has a door that leads to the demi plane from your bastion. Uh, when you issue the actual empower order, you get these runes inside the demi plane and you get five times your level in temporary hit points, which is kind of cool. You know, like if you're 13th level, that's really good. 65 hit points, temporary hit points. Wow. Yeah, that's, that is no joke. There's nothing that gives you, I think even more temp, more temporary hit points. 
Um, and one of them gives you, the Sanctum gives you temporary hit points uh, equal to your level to another PC. It also can cast heal on you. And in the Sanctum, which is for like Holy Symbol or Druidic people, um, you can use a word of recall to show up in your Sanctum and one of, uh, with your group and one of them gets a heal. So kind of cool. Um, there's some very, very interesting things. The War Room gives you a whole bunch of warriors. Maybe one of the wildest ones in this list. Um, let's see, War Room. Um, you, level 17, you, um, or sorry, that's, I forgot, 13, yeah. So level 13 is what we're talking about. Level 17 is the final, that's what the Demiplane is, uh, the Sanctum, and the War Room. Uh, it gives you the ability to have lieutenants who can command soldiers. And you can recruit a uh, hundred soldiers as an army and then send them off to fight, I guess. Um, it's, it's unclear how, um, yeah, a hundred guards, or you can get 20 that are on riding horses. I don't know why you, what, why you would do that. Um, and you must pay some gold and I guess they go fight and, and, it's really interesting because maybe there'll be some mass warfare rules and this ties into that. I don't know. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> I'm very surprised. And, you know, and this is the kind of thing that like, okay, somebody is maybe like running the, uh, the guild hall, which the guild hall I should probably cover over. Uh, that's another level 17. So it's sort of like if you're a, um, you have to have expertise. So you're like the rogue, you build a guild hall. And what the guild hall does is let you choose one of these types and you get benefits. Like I'm drawing a map or I can pay them 500 gold to procure a map of a known adventure location and deliver it to me if the DM says that map exists. Okay. Uh, I can sell 40 gallon barrels of ale for 10 gold. So like 400 gold. Um, I can make a thousand gold by making jewelry. So it's like I could make a thousand gold every week. Or I could um, decide that I'm going to make this war room and I have all the, the capacity to have these, this army. But what if it's never attacked or I can't use an army, you know, like, but I built the war room. Like, like, that's the thing is you only have these two buildings and you must just want to do their actions in some way. And it's not like the war room only does that. It has uh, some other capabilities to recruit lieutenants, but... But it really is just this sort of recruiting and and what do you, why? Like, like I don't necessarily want to do that week after week after week, especially when I may be explore, exploring, you know, some big, huge dungeon for months or, or months of playtime, at least. I don't know. It, it's hard to figure out this, this concept. Um, so let's go from here to two last pieces. The fall of a bastion is the idea that if you don't give consecutive if you didn't give orders for bastion turns equal to your level, uh, then everything is abandoned. The face place fall apart. So you can also choose to just let it fall apart and start over. Um, I guess I don't know that we needed rules for this, but um, and it's equal to your level. So like ten weeks that you're going to be away or something, or seven weeks. Like, does that happen? And if it does happen, it would be completely not due to the character's control or player's control. It'd be because that's what the campaign demanded. So I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, Bastion events is a cool idea. I like this concept, which is that we can, if you use the maintain order, so if the characters are not in the Bastion, they use maintain, the DM is going to roll on the Bastion events table every time. So it's maybe an incentive to, you know, be there or not be there, depending on whether you think this is overall positive or not. And we get these various things, like ha almost half the time, nothing will happen. Uh, there's an attack one out of 20 times, and you roll 66 for each die that rolls a one. One of your Bastion Defender dies, assuming you had a Barracks, which again is a level five structure, so you may only want it when you're low level, maybe, question mark. Um, if you have no Bastion Defenders, or if all the Bastion Defenders are dead, you lose a second special facility um, in addition to just one that you lose for uh, your attack. So you, if you don't do defenders, two of your facilities shut down and on your next bastion turn will be back. 
which is probably better than building a barracks and continually not having a different function, right? Like, what would you rather have? have? Forced to have one of your facilities essentially be always shut down defending your others or every now and then lose two. I think I see the math there. Um, there's some other neat things that are neat, like criminal hireling. Uh, you can, you, one of your hirelings was a criminal and you can decide whether you want to bribe people away and keep them or if you let them be arrested um, and one of your facilities goes down for a turn. You can gain extra bastion points by spending gold because you were hosting a cool event. It's kind of neat. I like it. Friendly visitors that give you gold because they came and used it. A special guest came and they have some sort of benefit to them, like they give you a letter of recommendation you can use in the future. Yeah, I think that's cool stuff. Um, some of your hirings got lost. Uh, the facility can't be used. You can see the theme here of what happens. Um, okay, I I think it's fine. I you know I I don't know that this is. Uh, I think it's fine. It's just. This, if this is happening four times per level, it's a little maybe too much. If twice per level, or some two times a level, we're going to resolve one of these, it, they could get old pretty fast. Um, so I think the system could be tweaked so that it, if it really is supposed to run often, then this would be fun, you know, that this would work out and be of interest, uh, to the, to the parties, to the DM, to the campaign to do this. So. All right, that's the review of the rules. After that is just a cantrip section that's in this playtest. So here's some of my big questions. <laughs> First interesting question, which I didn't come up with. Uh, a brilliant designer, a friend of mine came up with, said, should this be in the player's handbook? Because, hey, this stuff seems all player facing, right? The player is choosing which structure. The player is looking up the benefit. Players looking up what to craft or recruit or which of those orders to give. The player is going to need to borrow the Dungeon Master's Guide all the time to look this up. So maybe this should really be in the player's handbook. I thought it was really a good, you know, observation. Um, and, and there's precedence in that in the 2014 player's handbook that has a lot of the player side of rules. I don't really love things being split in different books, but yeah, it's interesting. All right, second topic I want to look at. If we look at published campaigns, does this work well? And I wanted to start with Waterdeep because Waterdeep Dragon Heist has a structure that you get, Troll Skull Manor. And it sort of fades into the background because the adventure sort of doesn't maybe exactly know how to play off of it, though it has some, it can be really a lot of fun. Uh, and there's some great supplements the Guild Adepts created. Uh, that you can look at that you know, people on my Patreon Discord are always raving about it. And it's for good reason. Designers did a fantastic job of that. Um, but it's okay. You've got Troll Skull Manor. And now we want to use the Bastion system. So do we suddenly at level 5 do something else? Um, there is no level 5 facility that resembles running a tavern. There is a pub later that I think is level 9. Uh, I believe is the pub. No, it's level 13. So there is no pub until level 13. So what do you do? Is is Bastion completely separate? Do you just sort of pretend that Trollskull Manor has inside of it, you know, whatever facilities you each of the characters created? You know, it that's a tough one. It's a tough one. So Storm King's Thunder. After level five, you're kind of traveling all over the place. So maybe you could visit it every now and then. I, I could see maybe weaving it in like, I'm going to protect a town, right? And um, so we'll put our stronghold, our bastion there, and then we'll travel from it. But it's going to be hard to visit it. So issuing orders will be really hard. It'll be a lot of maintain. Tomb of Annihilation, like we talked about, you know, Portney and Zaru is all at the start. And then you go out into the jungle and everything really happens very quickly. So there's going to be very few turns, even though you're supposed to go through 10 levels of play, 10 levels of play, and yet almost no um, opportunities to run these actions um, unless you change the rules up. Um, when you're in the tomb, you probably can't issue orders to the base. 
And so then you're just on maintenance. Um, but I guess it's going to be just a few weeks at most. You're going to be in there, if not days. So it wouldn't like not a huge problem, just maybe. But but you're kind of it's a lot of play without using the system. Spelljammer, uh, the default light of Xeraxis adventure. Um, unless you say that you can make your thing be on your ship, it's going to be kind of hard to go to like maybe the Rock of Brawl or wherever it is that you would have this facility. Um, and again, you'll probably have very few turns. Dragonlance. You're on the move. Everything's threatened. I don't know how it works there. So it's interesting to contemplate this system. And I think that I would want any system that is going to be in the DMG. It should probably support the types of adventures that people typically play. And if it doesn't, it's going to be a problem for campaigns. Unless it's meant to just facilitate a certain type of campaign play. That's cool if that's what it is. But then we should be honest about it only works you know, when you do something and then and then the system should push into that particular type of campaign, I think. Um, I would ask why the facilities seem to bypass and supplant downtime, which is currently in 5e the default for what you do when you have a space of time in between adventuring. It's totally cool that you would go to your home base. I like that a lot. Uh, I've got an article on my blog about um, leaving your home base behind. Um, yeah, it's cool to come back to your hometown, your starting village or anything like that. But, um, downtime should be something that you can run off of this and should be enhanced, I think, by a system like this. It's a good question as to whether you can both do downtime and a bastion turn. Like nothing says you can't, but, but it's a little weird because maybe I want to use downtime to buy a magic item, but I'm also generating points. So I'll eventually buy a magic item or should my dm now not allow me to use downtime to buy a magic item i don't know um i think it's very interesting that all these facilities are making gold as one of the big options you see time and time again but weirdly not balanced amounts of gold i don't know that the game needs ways to make more gold characters generally have more gold that they need and they don't have things to spend it on so I'd rather that you spend gold doing cool things with your facilities than using your facilities to generate gold, theoretically, weekly. Um, yeah. If anything, I would abstract it to say, like, give me a different lifestyle or um, give me things that I can do with my power and influence and, and kind of wealth rather than just straight up gold, because what do I even use gold on? Uh, and and the, some of the biggest costs in here, things like, you know, 2000 gold to upgrade a facility don't really make monetary sense. So they're kind of not really there, maybe. Um, I would ask whether the Bastion should be mobile. Something that we looked at with the franchise system is that you often leave your home behind. And at most, you're going to like abstract to this, but maybe it should be like the kind of thing that you can put on a Spelljammer vessel or that it allows you to, to be mobile like um we came up with the idea in the franchise rules in act ink book that you can you could have a tavern where every door leads to different places when you have the right key and so you can teleport to different towns through the doors and you can be in another tavern and come back right so that you can constantly and easily get to your facility or um your stronghold or that you can travel with it right it's in a blimp like we see in the Acquisitions Incorporated live streams. Um, so that idea of mobility, I think, is important. Or, you know, take your base with you or have access to it, get to it, get, get to and from it. Also to communicate with it. I just think you should be able to issue orders all the time. Um, you're going to have players who are going to say, hey, I have a sending stone. I'm going to give one to someone who works at this at my stronghold. And they should be able to just issue commands, right? Why not? Um, and then I'd say, why isn't that baked into the rules? Like, let's just let people talk back and forth. Because also, if this is your home base, it becomes the mouthpiece for the DM to say, hey, your home base reaches out to you. Here's what's going where they are. And that can give you clues towards that campaign or launch new events in the campaign. Having conversation back and forth between your bastion, to me, is one of the key ways that we can tell stories that are going to resonate based on the bastion, right? It's that thing I was talking about with the pirate ship, right? Like 
that you can learn what your pirate ship's been doing. You don't want to have to wait till you exit the dungeon, get all the way back to your bastion, and hey, what's been happening, right? Keep that conversation flowing and keep it interesting and fun and tell the stories of what happened in the bastion while the players are absent. I think that's great. It gives you a cutscene ability that makes play more, more engaging. Um, facilities, I would ask whether the system is better because of having rigid structures that you then have to replace as they level up because you want those BPs out of it, the bastion points. I would say that players, I would like to see the system facilitate any concept players have, right? Like don't create optimal choices. Uh, don't tell me that, you know, a barracks is level five and I'm an idiot to have it at level 17. Yes, a demi plane is a really cool idea and definitely works as a level 17 concept. But why can't I just have my tavern at any level? Why can't I just have an observatory at any label and it level and it just does different things or gets better or gets more powerful, right? Why can't I just have a place of refuge, which could be a demi plane at higher levels, but it's my secret spot, right? It's hidden and concealed somewhere. I think that would be really neat. Um, I'd, so I'd rather it be what I define it is rather than this. It also would prevent having 21 pages worth of material that has to cram into a Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, all right, almost done here. Uh, last thing, the events. Do whether the events work well with a campaign? Do they inspire stories, campaign developments? And I think they have some capability for that. You know, hey, special guest came. Here's how it impacts things but a little more thought to how you can integrate events into the campaign. So this has been fun for me. I hope it's fun for you to think through all these kinds of DMG design concepts. You know, we talked about this on our podcast, Mastering Dungeons, what it's like to um, look at the DMG and what is in it. So when I try to think of what 21 pages do I pull and whether I'd want to put these 21 in, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I think that 2014's DMG, an entire rule set, the more I think about it, the more I see it as a flexible system that was created by designers that weren't entirely sure what we do with the systems. So they wanted to speak to many ways we would run campaigns. And that's one of the strengths of the edition. I think that from Tasha's on, D&D 5e has become more sure of itself, but therefore dictated what it is to us. And I think this is an example of that, where it is encouraging a more narrow style of play with this system than what many DMs want. And I think that it would be more powerful if there was more flexibility to this. Um, I'm not looking for third edition. I enjoyed this book. Um, I enjoyed the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons versions. I don't think that we need rules for buying doors, right? That's not for sure. In fact, the opposite. I think we need less and less of that and more of help DMs and players craft really cool stories together and have that flexibility based on the type of campaign that they want. Um, so I'm excited to see where Bastion will go. As it stands, I probably would not use it. Um, so that is, you know, ultimately my review of this system. I think I would, I would use a different system. Um, even though it has some parts that are neat and thought provoking. So uh, I hope you enjoyed watching this video and thinking about bastions with me and I'll see you next time.